the state are still without power tonight after Zeta made its way across metro Atlanta and North Georgia. At one point, there were a million people without power. The storm bringing down trees onto power lines and homes as well. Three people have died as a result. We also know a handful of school districts have already decided to call off classes tomorrow because of the widespread power outages. You can find the list at 11alive.com, also scrolling at the bottom of your screen. Meanwhile, we have team coverage tonight from some of the hardest hit parts of the metro. Plus, we're tracking how outages will impact the last two days of early voting. But first, two people killed when a tree falls onto a home. Our Andy Parati has a story from Gwinnett County. The fire department did not release the names of those who died, but this is where it happened. This is the home and that is the tree that fell on top of it. In particular, the back side of the tree where the bedroom was, where the couple was sleeping, presumably sleeping in bed, where the tree fell and pinned them, killing them. Now, earlier today, we shot video with our drone showing you a different vantage point of what happened. And what you're looking at is a hardwood tree where the trunk split in half. One half of the trunk fell on the ground, the other on the home collapsing on the back side of the roof, falling into the couple's bed, killing them. We're told the people who died are young, a man and a woman in their 20s. They were found by the man's brother who stopped by to check on them about noon. After the storm passed, he then called 911. It took crews three to four hours to recover the bodies. Here's the fire department explaining the challenges of getting that done. Well, it's a technical rescue operation. Our technical rescue team is here. They are having to uh, use a large boom from a heavy record to try to stabilize the tree. We don't want the tree to roll or to cause any further collapse or damage. Uh, we're trying to cut away with a saw as we stabilize the tree, trying to release some of the pressure just so we can recover the bodies. Fulton County is among the districts not holding classes tomorrow because of the power outages. The district telling us late this afternoon it had 40 campuses without power and without Internet, and they're not sure when it will be dis, uh, restored. Parts of Fulton County saw a lot of damage from the storm. Our crews were in Roswell today after a tree fell on top of a condo and broke in half. A man was asleep on the third floor when the tree came down. He is OK. The family telling us they now have to wait for a large crane to help get that tree out of there. This is happening all over the metro area. Things ended tragically today in Cherokee County when this large oak tree fell onto a mobile home. You can barely see that home underneath it. A 22 year old was killed. Our Rebecca Lindstrom has a story from Cherokee County. It, this tree kind of tells part of the story. The force wasn't uh, able to rip up the roots, but it was the winds just able to twist and tangle this tree, just rip it apart. It is still being perched up with some other trees that are in the area, keeping it from being yet one more that would fall into the road. Now it was this force that made that large oak tree fall onto that mobile home in Ackworth. 22 year old Franklin White was in his room. Police say when they were able to get into the home, they found him still in his bed. Now he had been renting. He'd only been in the community for about two weeks. So the people in that area were not able to tell us much about him, about his life. But all day, police, fire, tree crews say that they have been bouncing from scene to scene, just trying to undo whatever damage they could. They were falling down on cars, they were falling on, on houses, and they were falling across roadways and power lines. And so it was a, it was a very dangerous situation. We had, I mean, at a given, any given time, I would just estimate, because I don't know a certain number, but I would say we had close to 30 roads closed at one time. It was much the same in Cobb County. If you were trying to get down Sewell Mill Road in East Cobb today, uh, you know it was treacherous, a lot of stop and start and turning around. This tree that you see here still in place. We shot this video at 10 in the morning. The tree still there, but it's now being guarded by police. Cobb County says they received more than 340 calls this morning about downed trees. We know about a dozen of those went into houses. We also saw busted gas lines, power lines, and there are still about 64,000 people in Cobb and Cherokee counties tonight. That's one of the big reasons why Cobb County has canceled school for tomorrow. Crews are out in force trying to restore power for hundreds of thousands of people, but they say it will take a couple of days to get everybody back online. Our 11 Alive Sky Tracker shot this fallen tree in Marietta suspended from power lines and hanging right over the road. This one in Roswell dangling so low trucks could not pass. Georgia Power says the storm knocked out power for about 610,000 customers with 4,200 power lines and poles damaged, but they are slowly getting people back online. At last, 
report, they had restored about 280,000 people. They were expecting this kind of widespread damage, and crews from other parts of the state have come in to help. You've been sharing some incredible images of the damage near you. Randy Rhodes posted this video from Calhoun. A tree down across a power line from uh, across his home. Uh, needless to say, the lights were out there. Cheryl Berger uploading this photo from Oakdale Road in the Candler Park neighborhood of Atlanta. Workers there using a crane to lift a tree that appears to have damaged two homes. Tim Sussman sent us these photos behind his apartment in Marietta. You can see how the trees were uprooted there, luckily falling away from the building. And many people saying that this was the extent of what the storm left behind leaves all over the place. Cheryl Martin Bittery says all good in West Marietta. You can send us your pictures or video through Facebook, the 11 Alive app and email at where ATL speaks at 11 alive.com. Power outages are causing a mess for counties in the home stretch of early voting tomorrow, the final day. But according to the Secretary of State, Brad Raffensperger, voting in 15 counties impacted by the storm today. Some polling places opened late. Others couldn't open at all. Here's Doug Richards. So no locations are open right now for voting at this moment. No. Wow. From the signs, Deer Lick Park certainly looked like an active voting site. We would come in a day to vote. Until would-be voters encountered the locked gate with access to the early voting site impossible. I'm probably going to go to the courthouse and see if I can vote there, if they're doing that there. That's closed too from what I hear. Is it really? Do you yeah. know why? The sites were closed because power was out. The county announced it was closing all five of its early voting sites. So I figured I'd go in and get my vote, but it's my luck. By early afternoon, Douglas County opened two early voting sites, including this one at the Dog River Library, where a line of voters had formed by mid-afternoon. I'm hoping that Deerlick, Deerlick's closed also. But with early voting ending tomorrow, the unexpected precinct closures forced voters to make new plans. I don't care where I have to go. I'm going to vote. One way or another, I'm voting. No, I'm determined to do it. It's just a matter of finding the right time and not waiting until the third when I think, you know, the lines are going to be really long. Douglas County is planning to open two new early voting sites tomorrow to partially compensate for the closed precincts today. You can find that information on 11alive.com. We also checked voting sites in four of Metro Atlanta's largest counties. Gwinnett County officials say their polling locations ran normally today. According to Fulton County's website, seven polling places were without power, but they have put mobile voting units at two of those locations, the Milton and Wolf Creek libraries. In Cobb County, four of 11 polling locations were listed as closed. DeKalb had low wait times in all polling locations. We are keeping track of the storm's impact on early voting on 11alive.com for the latest updates. Just look for this headline. Well, we saw those winds gusting when Zeta came through early this morning up around 51 miles per hour. So that's what brought so many trees down, those incredibly gusty winds that were widespread across North Georgia. And now Zeta is post-tropical and already moving through New Jersey. So it has traveled so quickly, moving at 55 miles per hour. Its forward speed enhanced by the jet stream also helped enhance those gusty damaging winds we saw. And it's going to be moving out of the Atlantic and it will soon uh, be nothing. It will soon be out over those open waters and it will weaken to nothing. So boy, it sure packed the punches that moved through here. That jet stream just blasting it off to the northeast. And now we have this frontal system in place. That front bringing in our first batch of cooler air tonight and then much cooler air as we head in through this weekend and next week. So coming up, we'll detail just how low those temperatures will go. We have all this information and a lot more on 11alive.com, including the very latest on power outages as crews attempt to restore power to thousands of homes. A spike in violent crime in Atlanta linked back to just a few people. Why police say the city is a little safer tonight. We're streaming right now. You know that. You know the drill. You know this is where you can go to watch the news. If you're not around a TV, we have a lot more 11 Alive news in prime time right after the break. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. 
For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice. 10 people arrested in connection with a spike in violent crime in Atlanta. Two more are still wanted. Investigators are calling them some of the most dangerous offenders in the city, and with their arrest, crime is dropping. Here's Joe Hankey. 10 defendants in custody, some facing federal charges, other facing state charges in Fulton County. Today, the FBI publicly identified these 10 individuals as being arrested over the past 10 weeks during an ongoing local, state, and federal operation known as Operation Phoenix. Some are charged with assault, others attempted murder, some are charged with drug, firearms, or gang-related crimes. These individuals were repeat violent offenders, that there was some uh, uh, nexus with them and violence. And, and, and they, we deemed them to be responsible for some of the most violent crimes in the city of Atlanta. Two suspects still wanted as part of the operation are Jamal Nickel and Demario Leith. During a press conference today, law enforcement officials said around May, crime began to increase in Atlanta as the city began to reopen following COVID-19 closures, and crime also increased around protests and civil unrest. There were aspects of social gatherings and, and ad hoc social gatherings that contributed to these air, these types of, of crimes. Uh, so it coincided with people gathering up around street racing. Uh, we had a, a shooting during that time as well. And so that's when we started to see it. Uh, and July was really the, the, the pinnacle. APD Interim Police Chief Rodney Bryant says in July alone there were 24 homicides. As of Wednesday, there have been 117 homicides in the city so far this year, compared to 99 in all of 2019. APD says the men arrested and two still wanted are connected by the crimes committed, with several linked to gangs. And during this afternoon's press conference, law enforcement officials said since arrests began as part of this operation, violent crime in the city of Atlanta has begun to drop off. And they said this is an ongoing operation with more arrests expected. Here's a look now at some other headlines we are following for you tonight, beginning with a deadly shootout outside of an Atlanta lounge. Police say just before 2.30 a.m., a man was shot outside a members only lounge on Ralph McGill. Police say an argument over the cost of admission ended in gunfire. The victim was shot in the chest, but police haven't released his identity or any information about the gunman. A Spalding County grand jury indicted Commissioner Don Hawbaker today on eight felony charges. The charges stem from back in February when he allegedly pointed a gun at his wife inside their home. Ha Baker is charged with aggravated assault and five counts of aggravated assault on law enforcement officers. The sheriff says he has notified the governor of the charges and is requesting that they start the process of removing Ha Baker from office. The number of people filing for first time unemployment claims has fallen to its lowest level since the pandemic, but it's still well above pre pandemic levels. The Labor Department reports first time jobless claims last week came in at 751,000 nationwide. 43,000 first time claims were filed in Georgia last week, down about 1,000 from the week before. With the days winding down until the election, five days left, we are seeing a lot of false and misleading claims 
about the candidates, but truth be told, that's been going on a lot more than the last few days. One going viral now says that Joe Biden's tax plan would increase property taxes by 3%. Jason Puckett with our Verify team looking into it. So there's this long chain message going viral. It says if you read Biden's tax plan, specifically pages 40 to 60, he quote, has a plan to tax you on your house at 3% of its value. This is above and beyond your property taxes you pay now. So let's verify. Does Joe Biden's economic plan include an additional property tax on homeowners? First, one reason this may be spreading now is the name of the poster, David Ramsey. Now, some posts have linked this claim to popular financial advisor Dave Ramsey, but they're not the same person. So now let's dig into the claim itself. Our main sources are Biden's published plans, analyses by two independent think tanks, and the National Conference of State Legislatures. So Biden's published tax plans look like this, about seven pages on their website. You can't look at pages 40 to 60, as the claim suggests, because they don't exist. Okay, but do his actual plans say anything about an increased property tax? No. Property tax is never mentioned in any of his plans, and analyses of Biden's proposed tax plan by the Tax Policy Center and Tax Foundation had no mention of property taxes either. The National Conference of State Legislatures shows that there's currently no property tax at the federal level, period. Property tax is currently decided by and paid to your state and local governments. So the president would have no power to change those taxes. That would take an act of Congress. Bottom line, this claim is false. If you've got other claims or questions for us to look into, send us an email. Your 11 Alive storm trackers track that fast moving Zeta as it moved through North Georgia overnight tonight and now it's moving out over the open waters of the Atlantic and it will soon be just a bad memory. But we have a frontal system now that's helping. It actually helped push Zeta along as well and it's going to help bring in some cooler air as we head in through this weekend. So temperatures are going to be running at least 20 degrees cooler for lows and highs for tomorrow and into the weekend as well. And then we're going to be around 35 degrees colder. Yes. 35 degrees colder next week. So big changes heading our way. 82 was our high today, 72 our low. We should be around 69 and 50. So we were unseasonably warm and sticky and humid and windy. It was really kind of a weird day after those incredible winds this morning. And we were only three degrees away from a record high, a record high 85 for the date set back in 1996. So the next few hours and into tomorrow, if you don't have power, your air conditioning uh, will get a break. It's going to be cooler tomorrow, so you'll be able to open your windows up. If you don't have power, you'll be a little bit more comfortable, and it will be pretty decent conditions for cleanup. It will be a lot less humid and more comfortable to be out there doing some hard labor. So as far as our forecast, as we head into tomorrow, we'll see those temperatures getting down to near 50 degrees, and then Saturday morning, it will be even colder, down in the mid-40s for lows. We'll be in the 30s in Clayton and in Dalton, and we could even see some frost across northeast Georgia over the course of this weekend. So a few leftover showers here possible, wrapping around the low here in North Georgia as we head in through the overnight hours. We'll see some clouds to start tomorrow, but don't despair. I think by the afternoon we should see mostly sunny skies and those dry conditions moving in here. So those dry winds gusting still up to around 25 miles per hour tomorrow and then into Saturday around 20 miles per hour. So do be careful. We could still be seeing some trees coming down. We could still be seeing some limbs coming down as well with these winds slowly starting to weaken uh, over time. So by the time we get to Sunday, things should be a lot calmer, but the cool air will be settling in over the course of this weekend. That'll put us in the mood for trick or treating and holiday Halloween holiday activities. So it should be definitely feeling a lot more fallish this weekend, mid 40s to the low 60s on Halloween itself. So it's going to be a great day to be out and about just celebrating the day with your kids and then heading into Sunday. We're up to seasonal temps. We see increasing clouds and don't forget to fall back on Saturday night into Sunday morning because we're going to end up seeing um, those shorter days next week and we'll end up seeing a lot less daylight during the day. So we'll see a cold regime next week. Temperatures getting down into the 30s on Monday and Tuesday morning. So a chilly start to voting day on Tuesday, getting all the way down to 36 degrees. 
A popular restaurant accused of racial discrimination when it goes uh, to its dress code. When it comes to that, we're going to hear from both sides coming up. Teen coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Prime Time, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast dispute between an Atlanta couple and a popular restaurant owner now has gone viral. The customers posted about it on Instagram, accusing the restaurant of racial discrimination over a dress code issue. Here's Latasha Givens to explain the story. She has on a video. This cell phone video posted on Instagram and shared thousands of times shows part of a heated exchange between a customer and an employee at Umi Restaurant in Buckhead. How crazy is that? She has on Adidas sneakers. You can hear the two arguing. The man saying he was asked to leave because he was wearing athletic shoes. He accuses the restaurant of racial discrimination, pointing to a white woman in the restaurant who was also wearing sneakers. Tensions rise and police show up moments later. Jordan, you gonna oh, I wear black people clothes, so I'm straight. Shut the Oh, the people online wanted to know more about what happened, so we reached out to the couple and the owner. We spoke with the owner, Farshid Arshid, by phone. 1,000% it was a mistake. Arshid says the dress code for the restaurant is posted out front and has been there for several years, but he admits they have not been perfect with enforcing it. Social media responding to the viral Instagram post with pictures of other people with athletic shoes dining at the restaurant. Arshid says he considers it an operational issue, not a racial one, touting the restaurant's diverse clientele, but he says he takes full responsibility. It was an absolute shortcoming from us. That's, okay. that's what I like everybody to know, and I like everybody to know that, that we are very sorry about how we handled it. The dispute caused such an uproar, Yelp had to temporarily limit comments until they could get more information. Arshid says his apology is not just to the couple, but also to the community. It's our establishment. We should have done better. We're beyond sorry and apologetic to the community. If a tree falls in a neighbor's yard, who's responsible for it? What you need to know when there's damaged property involved. Families are raising concerns about the Cobb County Detention Center coming up a reveal investigation into questionable care involving an inmate and the fight for jail records.
In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who. Metro Atlanta and North Georgia are in recovery mode after Zeta swept through today, falling trees, killing three people in Cherokee and Gwinnett counties. Hundreds of thousands still tonight without power. No determination yet as to when it will come back. Zeta brought a rare tropical storm warning from Metro Atlanta. And these photos from a gas station in North Georgia show the power of those cutting, slicing, dicing winds. The awning over the gas pumps torn down. The storm trapped one of our reporters in her neighborhood, too. That's why Paula Soro is giving us a look at the mess out in East Cobb. I'm in my neighborhood in East Cobb, and this is the only way inside and outside of the neighborhood from where I live. So as you can see, this massive tree is just blocking the whole road, and it's also toppled over several power lines, making this area just very dangerous. This is really the reason why we haven't had power since about four this morning. Neighbors who are stuck in this community continue to approach the area to check if it's been cleared and are wondering when the power will return. We lose power a lot in this end of the neighborhood. We lose power if the wind just barely blows, so it's not a shocker. It's the price you pay when you're living in a neighborhood with such old established trees. But I spoke to the Cobb County Fire Department and it says it has been actively working since two this morning with different agencies to try and clear roadways like this one, restore power lines, help people evacuate and rescue others. It's been all hands on deck out here. The fire department says the city of Marietta, Marietta Power, the Georgia Department of Transportation, 
and cable companies are working hard to fix all of this as quickly as possible. The fire department alone has had more than 20 pieces of equipment out on the road to do work and its command center is fully staffed right now prioritizing calls based on safety. But the biggest challenge has been getting to the areas in need. They say it's because there's been so much traffic out on the road so they're asking that if you don't have anywhere you need to be to stay home so that they're able to get their jobs done faster. For now we'll send it back to you guys at the station. Similar scenes all across the metro. So if a tree from a neighbor's yard falls into your yard, are they responsible? In Georgia, the answer is no. It's a responsibility of the homeowner where the tree landed to remove the tree and to fix damages. So you'll need to contact your insurance company if you find yourself in that situation. There is only one exception. If the tree's on your property and it falls on my property and I haven't given you notice that the tree is dead, then I'm responsible for removal and the damage the tree caused falling on my property. Unless the property owner has been given notice that the tree has a propensity to fall, that property owner is not liable if that tree comes down in adverse weather. So if there's no previous documentation alerting the neighbor that the tree could be considered dangerous, the case would be hard to prove. Documentation would include an assessment from an arborist or a written notice from a building tenant or third party. If you have other liability questions, you want to check out this story right now on 11alive.com or our 11alive app. Just scroll down to the As Seen on TV section of the Home tab. Hurricane Zeta hit the Louisiana coast directly as a Category 2 storm, killing at least three people and millions without power across several states. Dan Sheneman has the very latest as the storm continues to push up the East Coast. The first look at the damage left by Hurricane Zeta during a Coast Guard search and rescue and assessment flight over Grand Isle, Louisiana. As it appears that the most catastrophic damage was in the Grand Isle uh, area. The barrier island taking the brunt of the record-breaking 11th storm to make landfall this season, barreling ashore at a rapid 24 miles an hour. As a result, the rainfall totals was limited and the flood damage that we had really came from surge right along the coast. Winds clocking just shy of a major category three storm, whipping trees, tearing off roofs, downing power lines all along the Gulf Coast. Rain soaking Louisiana to Alabama and Mississippi, where cars were swamped in this Biloxi parking garage and in Gulfport, leaving boats littered along the roadway. By morning, Zeta racing through the southeast, bringing those lashing rains and tropical storm strength winds hundreds of miles inland and leaving millions without power in its wake. We're going to be out of power here for a few days, and our citizens are resilient. They're all helping each other. Back in Louisiana's St. Bernard Parish. We got the worst of it, but no serious injuries here in St. Bernard Parish, and we're, we're blessed because of that. There is gratitude that this very bad storm season has not been even worse. Well, we're still dealing with some winds out there. In fact, the National Weather Service just issued a wind advisory with winds gusting up to 35 miles per hour until the early morning hours until 3 a.m. on Friday morning. So our peak gusts earlier were at 51 in Atlanta, 53 in Canton, 51 in Rome. So these incredibly destructive winds we had earlier weakened a lot of the foundations of these trees. So when we get gusts at 30 to 35, that may be enough to send some of these tumbling, especially given how saturated the ground is. This system just ripped through here and then ripped up into the middle Atlantic. In fact, it's working its way out to sea. The National Weather Service has written its last advisory. And less than 24 hours ago, we were talking a tropical storm heading in our direction. So it really was moving fast, 55 miles per hour. And it will soon just be a really bad memory for many, many people. So as we head into the overnight hours, still seeing those gusty winds up around 30, 35 mile per hour gusts possible here into our Friday morning. Still pretty breezy out there, up around 25 miles per hour at times on our Friday. And then even pretty breezy as we head into the weekend, we could see some wind gusts up around 15 to 20 miles per hour. So we're still going to have to keep a very wary eye when we're out trying to uh, clean up or if in any wooded areas. I've heard that Kennesaw Mountain Park is just a mess with trees down. You can't even see the hiking trails that are so well established there with all the trees that have come down in that area. So as we head into this weekend, we're going to see a tremendous difference 
in the air mass. We have been sticky and tropical and humid and windy today. Very, this kind of odd weather kind of setting the tone for Halloween and this upcoming weekend. But as we head into this weekend, we're going to see much cooler air move in. So much more seasonal, typical of what you'd think of with going trick or treating and, and being outside for some Halloween fun. And then as we head in towards the beginning of next week into Election Day, those temperatures are going to be down in the mid 30s. So we're going to see tremendous changes around here the next few days. No more humidity, no more warmth. It is going to be pretty chilly. So overnight tonight, we're just going to begin the cool down. The first of the cold fronts moving through tonight, the second one over the weekend. So we'll be going around 50 degrees tonight and we will be staying on the cool side during the day tomorrow, about 20 degrees cooler than we were today. So coming up in just a few minutes, we'll talk more about the details you can expect this weekend. An inmate's family says the Cobb County Detention Center did not do enough to keep the brother safe while he suffered from mental illness. Jail records were released after a judge ordered the sheriff to produce them following a lawsuit by 11 Alive, revealing investigator Andy Burati has a story that the sheriff tried to stop. Is this Cobb County Sheriff Burke? It is. A concerned father calls the Cobb County Jail in 2019, warning staff his son, Bradley Emery, could potentially hurt himself. I've got a young a son out there, and since he's been in there, I've had to call out there several times and have him on suicide watch because he's threatening it. From the day he arrived at the detention center, staff knew Emory had attempted suicide in the past. One of them noting in a report, Emory advised that he cut his wrist a couple of months ago when his wife threatened to leave. The 33-year-old suffered from mental illness related to a traumatic brain injury. His family says the jail knew that. At the time, Emory was in custody for drug possession. He was a troubling inmate. He, he had issues, family issues. On Valentine's Day, jail staff found a rope made out of a torn mattress cover inside Emory's cell. His father, Don, growing more concerned for his son's mental health. Yes, he's been in terrible shape since he's been in there. I worry about him. He's my youngest. According to jail records, staff placed Emory under close observation at least two different times for threatening to hurt himself. Each time he was allowed to return to the general population after signing a contract promising not to kill himself. During that time, Emory sent this letter to his family writing, suicide is the only solution to my misery. Four days later, a fellow inmate found Emory in the shower with the bedsheet tied around his neck. 278 and Emory died three days later. While sheriff investigators found its staff did nothing wrong, Emory's family says the detention center did not do enough to keep him safe. I loved him to death. James is Emory's brother. So, you know, they put him on site watch and within hours they let him back out. Emory joins a list of hundreds of inmates who have died inside Georgia's four largest county jails. 217 deaths since 2004. Only one of them investigated by an outside agency. The rest, sheriff staff cleared themselves of any wrongdoing. State Representative David Wilkerson wants to change that. It should be investigated by the separate party. Held by our investigations in the Cobb County's detention center, Wilkerson plans to introduce legislation that would require an outside independent investigation into all jail fatalities. So if this is really about making sure the jails run safe and making sure that uh, people have a chance to have their day in court, then you'd want that independent investigation. Days after his son's death, Emory's father called the jail begging for answers. Can I get someone that, you know, someone that's got some answers? He died waiting from a heart attack. After, after I put him on suicide watch, and y'all guarantee me you were gonna watch him every 15 minutes. My son's dead. The sheriff didn't want to be interviewed, but he did say over the phone that each time a family member called concerned for Emory and his well-being, they had staff check on him. They say they simply can't monitor inmates every second of the day. They also say they hope to get funding to install a security camera in the pod where Emory was detained. 
Andy has been investigating conditions inside the Cobb County Detention Center for more than a year following the death of Cavell Wingo. He died alone in a padded cell despite begging for medical help for hours. You can watch Andy's previous stories right now on our 11 Alive YouTube page. As the tropical storm slowed Georgia's record-breaking early voting, we have the very latest numbers from the state coming up next. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. Early voting numbers remain strong in Georgia despite this morning's tropical storm. Today alone, nearly 150,000 people cast their ballots in Georgia. Since early voting began, more than 3.6 million people have voted, and that amounts to about 47% of the state's registered voters. Tomorrow is the last day for early in-person voting, and absentee ballots must be received by 7 p.m. on Tuesday. Florida is the focal point of the race for the White House today, with President Trump and Joe Biden crossing paths in that all-important battleground state. NBC's Alice Barr reports. In presidential politics, all roads lead to Florida, and today the two campaigns converge there. President Trump and Joe Biden both rallying in Tampa with their starkly different approaches to coronavirus on display. The president speaking to a tightly packed, mostly maskless crowd of thousands, touting a record high jump in economic growth last quarter. We are doing great. You see the number today? 33.1 GDP, the biggest in the history of our country by almost triple, right? Almost triple. But the gains don't make up for historic losses earlier in the pandemic, and economists fear another downturn, with new COVID cases topping 80,000 for the first time in a single day. I'm not going to shut down the economy. 
I'm not going to shut down the country, but I'm going to shut down the virus. Biden speaking to supporters in critical Broward County, the first of two socially distanced drive-in events. Recent polls show Biden with a four-point lead in Florida. That's within the margin of error. Seniors giving Biden a boost with President Trump's handling of the pandemic a top priority. I had COVID, so I do feel very strongly and have very strong feelings about COVID. Had he done something earlier, I might not have gotten it. He has done everything that anyone could have done. The Hispanic vote also key in this state. Biden now promising a task force to reunite more than 500 immigrant children separated from their parents at the border. Senator David Perdue and Democratic challenger John Ossoff went toe to toe last night in Savannah for their final debate. One hot topic, the latest COVID relief bill. Where is the relief, Senator? The PPP small business lending program expired in August. And what's being held up right now is being held up by the Democrats. We are totally ready to put this bill on the floor and fund another couple hundred billion dollars to get this done. Senator Perdue went after Ossoff's business record while Ossoff focused on the Republican health care plan. Senator Perdue's seat is one of two Senate races on the ballot in Georgia. Well, Hurricane Zeta made landfall yesterday evening and it just rocketed in through North Georgia during those early morning hours, taking down all those trees and is now exiting out into the Atlantic Ocean. And its last advisory has been written on it. It was a fast moving storm, largely because the jet stream helped aid it along on its trip. And we still have gusty winds out there. In fact, just about 30 minutes ago, the National Weather Service issued a wind advisory in effect through early morning hours on Friday, gusts up to around 35 miles per hour. And because the ground is saturated, we've had so much rain, we're 20 inches ahead for the year. And we've had these winds buffering us really for much of uh, the last 24 hours, a lot of these trees could still come down. So don't be surprised. Just be careful if you're out there, especially driving at night. You never know when something could be blocking the roadway. So do be careful. Winds will be gusty throughout this evening and into tomorrow as well. And even into the weekend, we'll continue to see some gusts up around 20 miles per hour. But slowly but surely, the winds will start to ease over the course of the weekend. So we should start to see some improvement by the time we get to Sunday. Um, we're looking at the jet stream that's just zipping along and that really just grabbed Zeta and moved Zeta very quickly off to the east. So uh, really won't be uh, anything to talk about as, except for all the cleanup that we have to do. But as far as tracking the storm, it is done. Uh, we're looking at a frontal system that helped also move Zeta through and behind that front, we're going to see some cooler air moving in about 20 degrees cooler as we head into tomorrow and then about 35 degrees cooler next week. Yes, we're going to be down in the mid 30s here in Atlanta come Election Day in the morning. So it is going to be brisk, the coldest temperatures we have had since early spring last year. So, yep, fall is here and we're going to be feeling it as we head into the weekend and next week. So the next 12 hours, we're going to see temperatures get down to around 50. We'll have some clouds around. We have that frontal system moving through, so there'll be some clouds. We think for the most part will be dry. There may be a few showers up in far north Georgia overnight. Friday, we're looking at a nine here, though. Uh, it would be a 10, except for a little on the cool side. 50 are low, 62 are high. And we'll have a few clouds around to start. But by the afternoon, I think it's going to be uh, really great. And if you are suffering from power outages, you should be able to open up your windows and get some fresh air because those temperatures are going to be down uh, in the low 60s tomorrow as opposed to low 80s. That's a 20 degree difference. That makes a difference when your air conditioner isn't working. So as we head into uh, tomorrow afternoon, we'll be in the low 60s. So kind of cool for Friday night football. Keep that in mind. Take your stadium blankets with you. And then as we head into Saturday morning, mid 40s, so it will be cool to start our weekend and then afternoon temps staying on the cool side through uh, Friday, Saturday, a little bit warmer, closer to normal Sunday. And then we go back down again into the mid 50s for a high temperature on Monday. So there goes Zeta and uh, it's going out into the Atlantic. But we are now focused on another little disturbance here over the Lesser Antilles. Uh, right now it has a pretty good chance of strengthening 60 percent chance in the next five days. I think they just upped that to 70%. I'm gonna have to check that out. But in other words, 
Hurricane season is not over yet. So cooler tomorrow and into our Saturday. Halloween's looking great. Low for mid 40s to low 60s. So it'll feel like fall. We fall back Saturday night. Get an extra hour of sleep on Sunday to get over your your sugar hangover that you may have. And then as we head into next week, staying cool and staying dry. Left in the cold, U.S. Olympian Ilana Myers Taylor says that she still hasn't received her absentee ballot as she trains out of state. And now it's too late. Up next, your options if you are planning to vote by mail. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Tomorrow is the final day to request an absentee ballot, but some people who have already requested their absentee ballot still have not received them as of yet. One is the three-time Olympic medalist, Alana Myers-Taylor, and she is training out of state right now. She still has not received her absentee ballot. She wants to know what her options are to make sure that her vote is counted. Whether you are in state or out of state, you only have two options to make sure that your vote is counted. If you received your ballot, you're worried about it arriving in time to be counted, you can go drop it off at the absentee ballot at one of the drop boxes in your county. But if you still have not received your ballot, your only option is to go vote in person and request your absentee ballot be canceled either at the precinct or by calling your county elections office. You following that so far? Regardless, the Secretary of State's office recommends you contact your county elections office. Another option would be to contact a voter rights advocacy group like Fair Fight Action. They have a hotline with representatives who can help walk you through your issue. That number is on the screen right now. Our 11 Alive voter access team 
It's also committed to making sure that your voices are heard. Send us an email at whereatlspeaks at 11alive.com or text us at 404-885-7600. We will try to help you any way we can and check out our voter guide on the 11alive.com slash vote. Thousands are still without power tonight. Zeta tore through the area. At least three people in Metro Atlanta have been killed by falling trees. Our team coverage of the storm's aftermath continues. Can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. are fast approaching and officials say a second wave of the coronavirus may be imminent. Doctors say there's no reason to cancel important family gatherings, but taking extra steps to ensure everyone's safety will be essential this year. Here's NBC's Dan Shinneman with the details. Wow. Everyone wants a happy and healthy holiday season. COVID-19 is the most significant public health challenge our country's faced in more than a century, and the pandemic is not over. A healthy holiday season will be a challenge this year, but not an insurmountable one. Common sense and simple precautions really is the solution that I see. Dr. Jake Deutsch says it's a good idea for everyone to get tested before the holidays. You can't really over test when it comes to the safety of your family and your loved ones. And Dr. Deutsch strongly suggests the usual measures, social distancing, hand washing, and wear masks. Masks work, they're simple, they're easy. There's no excuse why everybody's not participating on the same scale. With those measures in place, there is no need to go to extremes. But I don't think that you need to get into surgically sanitizing spoons between serving each other uh, because you're already in a close environment that you would have an anticipated exposure otherwise. And if travel is part of the holiday agenda. You know, there's a study out that this year, nearly a billion people have traveled by air and only 44 cases of COVID have been linked to direct transmission on a plane. It's important to remember, holiday gatherings can relieve some stress. And if we can have just moments to enjoy time with our family, I think that's also very important for our health. 
Safe holidays can still be happy holidays. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. A rare weather event leaves its mark on Metro Atlanta. Communities recovering tonight after tropical storm Zeta swept through North Georgia with driving winds and fierce rains. The force of those winds causing widespread, even deadly damage to some areas, bringing down large trees in the early morning hours, crashing onto homes occupied by sleeping families trapping people inside their neighborhoods. The chaos cutting power for thousands of Georgians, many still without power, more than 12 hours later. Hundreds of crews working to clear tangled and tattered power lines in order to restore electricity. We have team coverage for you tonight. Our crews tracking damage and cleanup across the metro area, including what those power outages mean for the final days of early voting. But we start off tonight with Andy Parati in Gwinnett County, where two people were killed when a tree crashed into a home. The fire department is not who actually found the victims inside. It was actually a brother who came to check on a couple here after the storm and what he found when he got here about noon today is this a very large tree on top of the house in particular the back side of the house crushed where a couple was staying and sleeping where they died now to give you another vantage point of some video that we shot earlier today by our drone take a look at what we have to show you what you're looking at is a hard wood tree where the trunk split in half one half of the trunk fell on the ground the other collapsed on the roof where the couple's bed was located killing them you can see it crushed the back corner of the home we're told they are young, a man and a woman in their 20s. It took hours to recover their bodies, two to three hours to safely recover their bodies. The Gwinnett County Fire Department says it responded to this home and 174 other storm related incidents between 4 a.m. and 8 this morning. We've been running trees down since really early this morning, about four o'clock. Firefighters began to receive an influx of calls all across the county of trees down on the roadway, wires down, trees down on houses. In fact, we had a, a, a an individual hurt uh, in Houston area that was taken to the hospital when a tree fell on uh, her home as well. Now, a longtime neighbor tells me the couple moved into the home, renovated it about two years ago. Their identities have not been released yet until their families are notified. Guys, back to you. A close call for a man in Roswell when a large tree toppled onto his condo on Forest Street. The 27 year old was asleep on a third floor bedroom but escaped uninjured thanks to that tree snapping in half. Parts of Cobb and Cherokee counties also dealing with major messes. Those powerful wind gusts knocking trees onto homes and across roadways. Rebecca Lindstrom has more on the havoc created by Zeta. Oh, where is she? As the tree sliced through this Marietta home in the middle of the storm, Jeff and his wife Renee Dodd say it became a fight for survival. Their 13 year old daughter was trapped in her bed. I was cutting her bed with a knife, anything to get her out. I tried to reach out for her over the tree and we couldn't even reach. Renee said she could see one of her daughter's legs starting to turn purple and both started to hurt. Now out and safe, they know they were lucky. I was like, wow, you know, blessed. In Ackworth, 22-year-old Franklin White did not survive when a tree fell onto the room he was renting in the Eastgate Mobile Home Park. They couldn't find him nor see him, but they knew that a tree had fallen through the room. Rescue crews say he was still lying in his bed. Across Cherokee and Cobb County's power is still out for more than 60,000 houses and dozens of streets remain blocked. Right before the bridge. Micah Collins normally uses these forklifts to deliver roofing material, but today he used them to clear Canton Road. I asked him, I said, hey, I've got some equipment out back. My guys aren't going on the road right now due to the weather. Would you like some help? Going to work. Families living in Charlton Forge in Marietta wish they could get a crew to their neighborhood. This power line has blocked cars from going in or out, leaving about 300 families stranded. And the whole neighborhood's out walking, and you kind of feel this, you know, sense that you're bound to your house with no power and no internet. At first, the district thought it could shift school to virtual to keep students engaged despite the storm, but even that worked, uh, not even that worked, rather, when the power went out. So Cobb County has, again, canceled classes for tomorrow. It was an intense night for anyone who experienced the storm. Jason Bonner sent this video from Hiawassee of the rain coming down sideways. And a moment of levity here from Shannon Fitzsimmons, whose Holloway decorations got a little help from the wind out there. Pretty spooky show out there as we get closer and closer, closer to Halloween, but 
hopefully something to kind of give you a little bit of a change there too, Sam. Oh gosh, yes, that was very sticky and humid and warm today. That windy, warm, tropical feel to the air. It's not going to be like that as we head into Halloween. It's going to be cold and it's going to be crisp. It's going to feel like it should this time of year. So we're going to see the changes. So our peak gusts today as a storm moved through early this morning, 51 in Atlanta and in Rome, 53 in Canton. We had 38 mile per hour gusts in Eatonton, 43 in Athens and 46 in Gainesville. So gusty winds causing those trees to come down and it's still pretty windy out there at this hour. Right now we have sustained winds anywhere from 21 miles per hour in Atlanta to 25 miles per hour in Marietta. So still gusty enough where we could see some problems with trees coming down. And I think that's what motivated the National Weather Service to issue a wind advisory in effect until four in the morning, gusts still up to 35 miles per hour. And just the way the trees were kind of buffered all morning long and the ground is so saturated, it's not gonna take much to see some of these topple over yet tonight. And we have had so many trees. I'll be interesting to hear the final count. If we can even count all of them or at least have a really good estimate. So the winds as we head into the overnight hours are gonna to continue to be pretty strong up around 35 miles per hour at their peak gusts and still breezy throughout tomorrow as well. And it's gonna feel pretty chilly out there as these temperatures start to tumble. So coming up, we'll talk about what you can expect for Friday night football and or Halloween weekend. Today was the second to last day of early voting, but the Secretary of State says the foul weather outside caused issues for 15 counties. Cobb County had to shut four of its 11 polling locations, while Fulton County placed mobile voting units at two of the seven sites that lost power. And as 11 Alive's Doug Richards shows us, none of Douglas County's five early voting sites opened on time. The Douglas County Courthouse is this county's busiest early voting site which was evident today, even though the site was closed because of a power outage. We saw voters continually showing up to try to get into the locked building, turned away by power outages that compelled the county to initially shut down all five of its early voting sites. Douglas County experienced widespread power outages through much of the day. Another early voting site at Deer Lick Park was likewise shut tight, as would-be voters drove up only to find the gates locked. The polls close for early voting tomorrow, so uh, hopefully the courthouse will be open tomorrow, or I have to find out if there's another place in Douglas County to go vote for. Will this deter you from voting? No, no, I'll try to find a way again. I guess I'll just wait for election day, but no matter what, I'm still voting. By early afternoon, Douglas County had opened two of its five early voting precincts. This was Dog River Park Library, where a line had formed when we visited mid-afternoon. Douglas County hopes to have all of its sites back open by Friday, and the county announced it has added two sites to Friday's roster in order to help compensate for the lost time today. You can find those sites on 11alive.com. We have much more information about polling locations, voting hours, and uh, you will find it all on our 11 Alive app in our complete voter resource guide. You can also sign up for weather alerts there and check out the latest conditions wherever you are. Found a spike in violent crime. Atlanta police say they are starting to see a drop after arresting 10 people, and they're still looking for two more key suspects. Joe Hinkey tells us about Operation Phoenix. We began to see crime start to increase in May of this year, which coincided with the opening of uh, this city. As the city of Atlanta reopened during the COVID-19 pandemic, APD Interim Police Chief Rodney Bryant says violent crime in all parts of the city increased, with spikes also around the time of protests, civil unrest, and street racing. Bryant says his intelligence unit identified several suspects believed to be the source of some of the most violent crimes. They showed me a network of individuals that they believed were truly committed to continuing violence and thought that they were having a significant impact on the crime that we were seeing inside the city. In response, Bryant says he began what is now known as Operation Phoenix, a joint effort between APD, the FBI, U.S. Attorney's Office, and other state and federal agencies. The results so far, the arrests of these 10 individuals. Some are charged with assault, others attempted murder, some are charged with drug, firearms, or gang-related crimes. Still wanted are suspects Demario Leith and Jamal Nickel. Importance was speed and certainty of them being incapacitated uh, from committing other types of crime back on the street. And so that's where we got involved. 
U.S. Attorney B.J. Pack says several of the defendants are now facing federal charges. Those charges were brought, he says, with the goal of keeping the defendants off the streets. As during the COVID-19 pandemic, the federal court system could prosecute them quicker than local courts. Federal government, the federal prosecutors, we have grand jury going right now. We have um, a court system, we have firearm laws that we can reach them and charge them. And so it's much it's important that we protect the community. That's priority number one. So 10 arrests made so far from this operation. Those two other suspects are still wanted. And the FBI and APD tell us that this will be an ongoing operation. And they expect to announce even more arrests in the future. All this week, we have been focusing on the lesser shown impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on some of Georgia's overlooked communities. People of color are particularly vulnerable, and a recent survey found nearly half of Hispanic and Latino renters fear they can't pay their rent on time. Matt Pearl has the story. You come into Dalton and you really don't see anything more than any other suburban town. But then you go to the across the railroad tracks and you start seeing a lot of the taquerias, handwritten signs, colored signs. I'm in the heart of the, the Hispanic community. I would think that that's everybody's dream, to belong to a community that you care about and a family that you love. My name is Dora Prime. Here is a good picture, too. My family and I moved to Dalton in May of 1979. My mother was diagnosed with congestive heart failure the end of June. She just started getting worse and worse and worse. Family, friends were there to say their farewells, eating together around the table, um, talking, and doing what we weren't supposed to do. You know, we, 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 we defied the, the recommendations of COVID protection. 19 of us ended up getting infected. My little brother, Julio, she's gone and, and he's there to you. Most of our families are considered essential workers. They lost jobs in hotels, in cleaning, um, maybe in agriculture. This is the carpet capital of the world. Sometimes they are working seven days a week nonstop, eight, 10, 12 hour shifts. And if the demand for the product is there, they have to do that. There is a disconnect and a distrust with our uh, healthcare system here. When you go to the health department and they have to pass the jail, our community has been attacked uh, in a very negative way. They are the um, workforce of this community. And uh, in spite of all of that, never been recognized for their contributions. The schools are open now. Many things they are trying to go back to normal, but uh, we are trying to reinforce and remember that the virus is not going to go away. We need to take care of each other in order to go through this uh, pandemic. This is from my visit on Monday. I prayed before I went in and I said, Lord, help me bring healing and a little bit of joy to my brother. Just help me, use me. It is not easy. I wouldn't desire this on anybody. And I pray for all the COVID victims because there are many. A little more than two weeks after I interviewed Dora Price, in fact, just this past Friday, she sent me a text message to tell me her little brother had passed away. Julio Salazar was 55 years old, one of now nearly 8,000 Georgians who have lost their lives to COVID-19. Matt Pearl has spent the last few months documenting the impacts of COVID-19 on some of Georgia's most overlooked and underserved communities. You can watch his entire series right now at 11alive.com slash the ripple. Don't forget, we are streaming right now on our 11 Alive YouTube channel. You can subscribe there, join the conversation. Let us know what you're thinking. There's more 11 Alive news in primetime after this break.
household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things The Atlanta Police Department says it may soon change a policy that allows its officers to handcuff children. This follows a reveal investigation involving the arrest of a 10 year old boy. Reveal investigator Andy Parati looks at how the conversation began. Two Atlanta police officers respond to a call in a South Atlanta neighborhood. When they arrive, it's a 13 year old boy accusing a 10 year old of pointing a weapon at him following an argument during a neighborhood football game. One says it was a real pistol. The younger child claimed it was a BB gun. 11 Alive is not identifying the children. Who had the gun? It was a cat gun. It was a cat gun? Where's the cat gun at? Oh, you threw it down there? The elementary student never runs away, is not combative, or denies having a weapon. Instead, he walked the officers over two doors down to a wooded area barefoot, where he says he tossed it. Oh, you threw it in here? Instead of searching for a weapon, the officers walk away. I'll tell grandma was a BB gun, I guess. I'm not going in the woods. I'm not even. 20 minutes later, an officer asks the 10 year old to put on his shoes right here. and then handcuffs him behind his back. Why are we arresting him? Meg Strickler is a criminal defense attorney not affiliated with the case. Why did this escalate to we're talking to one party, we talked to the other party, there was an issue, but without the gun, all it is is a tiff. Coming up tonight at 11 on Up Late, what a local judge had to say after we shared the video with him. Plus, we sit down with Atlanta's interim police chief to get his thoughts about the department's policy that has allowed officers to arrest and potentially handcuff more than 200 children under the age of 12. That's coming up tonight at 11 on Up Late. Well, your 11 Alive storm trackers have been watching uh, post-tropical Zeta move away from us now, and that's going to leave as much different weather for the weekend. You may be able to see the flags still flying here in downtown Rome. They're really whipping. We have some very gusty winds, and it's kind of setting the stage for our Halloween weekend. We're going to have a little bit of a chill in the air as we head through this weekend. We had to pull out the Halloween uh, celebratory graphics just to show you the forecast here so it will be a little cool especially if you're going to be out particularly late and one thing I want you to notice is we're going to end up seeing a full moon and not only is it a full moon but it's the second full moon of the month which makes it a blue moon and it happens to be happening on Halloween and here's a fun fact every Halloween full moon is a blue moon because the moon cycles 29 and a half days so it's if you are lucky enough to get a full moon on Halloween it's also a blue moon meaning the second one in the month and it's going to be right around 61 degrees at 705 as that moon comes up 
and here's one from a couple of years ago, but we are going to end up seeing maybe just a few clouds over the moon, just enough to make it look really spooky, just the way we like it. Let's take a look at the current pattern. What's happening here? Well, that cool air is going to come rushing on in as we head into the beginning of next week. This is the coldest air that we have seen since last spring. So it's going to be a real reality check for us. We'll be able to pull out the sweaters and the jackets because it is indeed going to be down in the 30s and we'll have our first frost, I do believe, next week. National Weather Service hasn't put any advisories out yet, but they probably will come Monday and Tuesday. So this is what is left of Zeta. It's buzzing on out to sea on the jet stream. This is taking a trip and you know, sometimes if you fly in a plane, if you can get on the jet stream, you can get there a lot sooner. Same thing happened to Zeta as it was moving at 55 miles per hour. That's a fast moving storm. So we have this frontal system that also helped kind of push Zeta along. And behind that, we're seeing a little cooler air move in. So it's going to be about 20 degrees cooler tomorrow than it was today. So all this sticky, uh, humid air that looks red here on our temperature contour map. Uh, it's going to be pushed out and we're going to see some cooler air arrive. But boy, today 82 and it was humid uh, after morning low of 70. We should be around 69 and 50 this time of year. So we were well above average and we were only three degrees from that record of 85 degrees. that was set back in 1996. So our temperatures right now 63 in Blairsville. Still pretty warm up there. 57 in Rome. 54 in Carrollton. So you can see how temperatures are kind of cooling from west to east, and that's the way the uh, wind is coming from right now, too. So we'll slowly see temperatures cool overnight. Still gusty winds out here tonight with those winds up around 20, gusting to 30, maybe even some gusts up to 35. So the National Weather Service has issued a wind advisory until 4 a.m. Be very cautious out there on the roadways. There could still be some more trees coming down as they were weakened throughout this morning by those uh, buffering winds early today. And now it's continued to be gusty enough to bring them down. So as we head into the overnight hours, right around 50 degrees. And then tomorrow, we'll see temperatures get into the low 60s. So a pretty nice day all in all. Maybe a few showers up in the North Georgia mountains yet tonight. And then a few clouds to start tomorrow. But by the afternoon, we should see those clouds lift and a very nice pattern for Friday night football for high school games. It will be cool. So you can take your stadium blankets, dress warmly, and uh, just enjoy the game. So it will be cooler on our Friday, 20 degrees cooler. Cooler still on our Halloween. We'll be down in the mid 40s Saturday morning. What a great time to go trick or treating. We fall back Saturday night. Sunday looks pretty seasonal, okay, with a few clouds around, and then we really chill out at the beginning of next week. Temperatures down in the mid-30s on Election Day, only in the low 60s for high temperatures. So definitely a cool time to go vote. All right, Sam, thank you so much. The Trump administration is pushing a new policy that would require insurers to disclose pricing for common tests and procedures up front. The pitch comes just days ahead of the election as President Trump has been hammered by Democratic presidential nominee Here. Joe Biden over his response to the pandemic. The car, now, if approved, the requirements would take effect gradually over a four year period. The Trump administration has also tried to require hospitals to disclose prices, but the measure is facing a federal lawsuit from the industry alleging coercion and interference with business practices. United Airlines plans to offer free coronavirus tests to passengers on select routes. The airline is calling the plan a pilot program for now. The four week trial run starts November 16th. Passengers will have to arrive three hours before their flight to get rapid test results in time. For now, United will test people flying between Newark's airport and London's Heathrow. People flying into the UK will still face a mandatory 14 day quarantine. Disney World says it plans to lay off more than 700 performers. The company says this news comes as many of the live entertainment shows at the parks are no longer happening. These layoffs are part of the 28,000 jobs the company planned to eliminate because of the pandemic. Two thirds of the people being laid off work part time. Isolation among the elderly during the pandemic could affect their mental health. How some states are making changes and stepping in to help. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. 
the things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We the latest White House Coronavirus Task Force report shows Fulton, DeKalb, and Gwinnett have had the highest number of new COVID-19 cases in the last three weeks. Fulton reported 182 new cases yesterday and has the highest number of COVID cases in the state. The county is averaging more than 150 cases each day. The numbers show DeKalb experienced an increase of 130 cases yesterday. It's averaging about 107 cases each day. That is up from the week before. And Gwinnett County reported 107 new cases yesterday, bringing its total to more than 30,000. The county is averaging 97 cases per day. That's actually a decrease from the week prior. COVID-19 restrictions have created a parallel crisis for elderly patients living in nursing homes. Many are on lockdown, meaning their families can't come and visit with them. The isolation that is meant to protect them can in some cases cause other serious health issues. The stress of isolation for the last six months has prematurely aged some of the patients that really don't have that much time left. It's why the latest or why they're why rather at least seven states have started classifying family members as essential caregivers. The hope is that careful visits will save lives. In Georgia, that's not an option. Some nursing homes have been on lockdown for months now, and staff members are trying to find ways to let the residents know they are not alone. In Griffin, seniors at the Brightmore Nursing Center participated in a drive up parade over the weekend. They held up signs for loved ones telling them how much they missed being able to hug them and telling them to keep up their spirits. Right now, cases in the county are considered to be in the yellow zone, which means they can allow outdoor visitation. They're looking to get below a 7% positivity rate to start allowing indoor visits. The staff is asking everyone to mask up and help make that happen so seniors can hug and visit with their loved ones once again soon. Families are raising concerns about the Cobb County Detention Center. Coming up, a reveal investigation into questionable care involving an inmate in the fight for jail records. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Metro Atlanta and North Georgia are in recovery mode tonight after Zeta swept through earlier today. Falling trees killed three people in Cherokee and Gwinnett counties and thousands are still without power tonight. Zeta brought a rare tropical storm warning for Metro Atlanta. These photos from a gas station in North Georgia show the power of those winds. The awning over the gas pumps torn down. The storm actually trapped one of our reporters inside her neighborhood. Paula Soro gives us a look at the mess in East Cobb. I'm in my neighborhood in East Cobb, and this is the only way inside and outside of the neighborhood from where I live. So as you can see, this massive tree is just blocking the whole road, and it's also toppled over several power lines, making this area just very dangerous. This is really the reason why we haven't had power since about four this morning. Neighbors who are stuck in this community continue to approach the area to check if it's been cleared and are wondering when the power will return. We lose power a lot in this end of the neighborhood. We lose power if the wind just barely blows, so it's not a shocker. It's the price you pay when you're living in a neighborhood with such old established trees. But I spoke to the Cobb County Fire Department and it says it has been actively working since two this morning with different agencies to try and clear roadways like this one, restore power lines, help people evacuate and rescue others. It's been all hands on deck out here. The fire department says the city of Marietta, Marietta Power, the Georgia Department of Transportation and cable companies are working hard to fix all of this as quickly as possible. The fire department alone has had more than 20 pieces of equipment out on the road to do work and its command center is fully staffed right now, prioritizing calls based on safety. But the biggest challenge has been getting to the areas in need. They say it's because there's been so much traffic out on the road, so they're asking that if you don't have anywhere you need to be to stay home so that they're able to get their jobs done faster. For now, we'll send it back to you guys at the station. Well, if a tree from a neighbor's yard falls into your yard, are they responsible? In Georgia, the answer is no. It's the responsibility of the homeowner where the tree landed to remove the tree and to fix the damage. So you'll need to contact your insurance company if you found yourself in this situation today. There is only one exception. If the tree's on your property and it falls on my property and I haven't given you notice that the tree is dead, then I'm responsible for removal and the damage the tree caused falling on my property. Unless the property owner has been given notice that the tree has a propensity to fall, that property owner is not liable if that tree comes down in adverse weather. 
So if there's no previous documentation alerting the neighbor that the tree could be considered dangerous, the case would be hard to prove. Documentation would include an assessment from an arborist or a written notice from a building tenant or third party. If you have other liability questions, you'll want to check out this story on the 11 Alive app right now. Just scroll down to the Ask Seen on TV section of the Home tab. Hurricane Zeta hit the Louisiana coast directly as a Category 2 storm, killing at least three people and leaving millions without power across several states. NBC's Dan Shittiman has the latest on the storm as it continues to push up the east coast. The first look at the damage left by Hurricane Zeta during a Coast Guard search and rescue and assessment flight over Grand Isle, Louisiana. As it appears that the most catastrophic damage was in the Grand Isle uh, area. The barrier island taking the brunt of the record-breaking 11th storm to make landfall this season, barreling ashore at a rapid 24 miles an hour. As a result, the rainfall totals was limited and the flood damage that we had really came from surge right along the coast. Winds clocking just shy of a major category three storm, whipping trees, tearing off roofs, downing power lines all along the Gulf Coast. Rain soaking Louisiana to Alabama and Mississippi, where cars were swamped in this Biloxi parking garage and in Gulfport, leaving boats littered along the roadway. By morning, Zeta racing through the southeast, bringing those lashing rains and tropical storm strength winds hundreds of miles inland and leaving millions without power in its wake. We're going to be out of power here for a few days, and our citizens are resilient. They're all helping each other. Back in Louisiana's St. Bernard Parish. We got the worst of it, but no serious injuries here in St. Bernard Parish, and we're, we're blessed because of that. There is gratitude that this very bad storm season has not been even worse. And it looks like it is going to continue on. We're watching another area we'll be talking about in just a few minutes around the Lesser Antilles that could end up being our next tropical system. So stay tuned. Hurricane season is not over yet. So as Zeta came on shore, really moved quickly, as you heard in that story, story moving at around 24 miles per hour, I believe, as it approached the coast, now moving at 55 miles per hour. So it caught a ride on the jet stream and it pushed off over to the east and that's where it is right now and still lashing the coast with quite a bit of uh, gusty winds and our peak gust as the storm went through 51 miles per hour in Atlanta 53 in Canton 46 miles per hour in Gainesville so that was enough to bring down a lot of trees and we have a wind advisory in place because the National Weather Service was watching these winds up around 35 miles per hour still gusting at this hour and just worried about the condition of the trees having sustained all the winds earlier today, the ground is saturated, so it's soft. Trees can easily topple over yet. So wind advisories in place until early tomorrow morning with those gusts up to 35 miles per hour. Right now we have sustained winds around 16 in Duluth, 21 in Cannes, 25 in Marietta still, 21 in Atlanta. And the forecast as we head through the overnight, we will have some of those gusts up around 35 miles per hour, sustained around 20. And that continues off and on throughout the day on Friday. They should weaken a little bit, should have gusts around 25 on Friday and then around 20 on Saturday. So slowly but surely, these winds will ease. And then the cool air is going to come pouring in and coming up. We'll talk about just how chilly those temperatures are going to be. Sam, thank you. An inmate's family says the Cobb County Detention Center did not do enough to keep their brother safe while he suffered from mental illness. Jail records were released after a judge ordered the sheriff to produce them following a lawsuit by 11 Alive. Reveal investigator Andy Parati has a story the sheriff tried to stop. Romeo Kelly. Is this Cobb County Sheriff Park? It is. A concerned father calls the Cobb County Jail in 2019, warning staff his son, Bradley Emery, could potentially hurt himself. I've got a young a son out there, and since he's been in there, I've had to call out there several times and have him on suicide watch because he's threatening from the day he arrived at the detention center, staff knew Emery had attempted suicide in the past. One of them noting in a report, Emery advised that he cut his wrist a couple of months ago when his wife threatened to leave. The 33-year-old suffered from mental illness related to a traumatic brain injury. His family says the jail knew that. At the time, Emery was in custody for drug possession. 
he was a troubling inmate. He, he had issues, family issues. On Valentine's Day, jail staff found a rope made out of a torn mattress cover inside Emory's cell. His father, Don, growing more concerned for his son's mental health. Yes, he's been in terrible shape since he's been in there. I worry about him. He's my youngest. According to jail records, staff placed Emery under close observation at least two different times for threatening to hurt himself. Each time he was allowed to return to the general population after signing a contract promising not to kill himself. During that time, Emery sent this letter to his family writing, suicide is the only solution to my misery. Four days later, a fellow inmate found Emery in the shower with the bed sheet tied around his neck. 278 and it started a single floor. There's no pulse. Emery died three days later. While sheriff investigators found its staff did nothing wrong, Emery's family says the detention center did not do enough to keep him safe. I loved him to death. James is Emery's brother. So, you know, they put him on site watch and within hours they let him back out. Emory joins a list of hundreds of inmates who have died inside Georgia's four largest county jails. 217 deaths since 2004. Only one of them investigated by an outside agency. The rest, sheriff staff cleared themselves of any wrongdoing. State Representative David Wilkerson wants to change that. It should be investigated by a separate party. Held by our investigations in the Cobb County's detention center, Wilkerson plans to introduce legislation that would require an outside independent investigation into all jail fatalities. So if this is really about making sure the jails run safe and making sure that uh, people have a chance to have their day in court, then you'd want that independent investigation. Days after his son's death, Emory's father called the jail begging for answers. Can I get someone to, you know, someone that's got some answers? He died waiting from a heart attack. After, after I put him on suicide watch, and y'all guarantee me you were going to watch him every 15 minutes. My son's dead. The sheriff did not want to be interviewed, but he did say over the phone that each time a family member called concerned for Emory's well-being, that they had a staff member check on him. They say they simply cannot monitor inmates every second of the day. They also say they hope to get funding to install a security camera in the pod where Emory was detained. Andy Parati has been investigating conditions inside the Cobb County Detention Center for more than a year now following the death of Cavell Wingo. He died alone in a padded cell despite begging for medical help for hours. You can watch Andy's previous stories right now on 11 Alive's YouTube page. Has the tropical storm slowed Georgia's record breaking early voting? We have the latest numbers from the state next. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. 
on 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Early voting numbers remain strong in Georgia despite this morning's tropical storm. Today alone, nearly 150,000 people cast their ballots in Georgia. Since early voting began, more than 3.6 million people have voted. That amounts to about 47% of the state's registered voters. Tomorrow is the last day for early in-person voting and absentee ballots must be received by 7 p.m. Tuesday. Florida is the focal point of the race for the White House today with President Trump and Joe Biden crisscrossing paths in that all important battleground state. Here's NBC's Alice Barr. In presidential politics, all roads lead to Florida, and today the two campaigns converge there. President Trump and Joe Biden both rallying in Tampa with their starkly different approaches to coronavirus on display. The president speaking to a tightly packed, mostly maskless crowd of thousands, touting a record high jump in economic growth last quarter. We are doing great. You see the number today? 33.1 GDP, the biggest in the history of our country by almost triple, right? Almost triple. But the gains don't make up for historic losses earlier in the pandemic, and economists fear another downturn, with new COVID cases topping 80,000 for the first time in a single day. I'm not going to shut down the economy. I'm not going to shut down the country, but I'm going to shut down the virus. Biden speaking to supporters in critical Broward County, the first of two socially distanced drive-in events. Recent polls show Biden with a four-point lead in Florida that's within the margin of error. Seniors giving Biden a boost with President Trump's handling of the pandemic a top priority. I had COVID, so I do feel very strongly and have very strong feelings about COVID. Had he done something earlier, I might not have gotten it. He has done everything that anyone could have done. The Hispanic vote also key in this state. Biden now promising a task force to reunite more than 500 immigrant children separated from their parents at the border. Senator David Perdue and Democratic challenger John Ossoff went toe to toe last night in Savannah for their final debate. One hot topic, the latest COVID relief bill. Where is the relief, Senator? The PPP small business lending program expired in August. What's being held up right now is being held up by the Democrats. We are totally ready to put this bill on the floor and fund another couple hundred billion dollars to get this done. Senator Perdue went after Ossoff's business record while Ossoff focused on the Republican health care plan. Senator Perdue's seat is one of two Senate races on the ballot in Georgia. Well, it's that time of year again, I and mean, hopefully we'll start wrapping up the hurricane season soon. But here we are in the midst of fall, and that means that it's time to do our, our annual fall back, which means our evenings are going to be longer. Our sunset's going to be around 545 next week. Isn't that? It's always a little sad that we don't have more time to get stuff done. 
in the evening hours. But don't forget to turn your clocks back one hour on Saturday night. I know a lot of them do it automatically. Of course, our phones do it automatically. But there's always one clock that I forget to change in my house, and it catches me by surprise. So uh, one extra hour of sleep, that's good news on Sunday morning. And it'll be a good day to sleep because temperatures will be cool. There'll be a little nip in the air, and that always makes you want to get under the covers and stay a little longer. So those temperatures are going to be going down as we head through this weekend. And I think that's a good thing after we were up to 82 degrees today. Uh, 81 in Rome, 82 in Dalton, 84 in Athens and Eatonton. It was really warm and humid and sticky and windy. Well, now we're seeing a different air mass poised to move in. It's moving in out of the upper Midwest. We're going to see the coldest air we've seen so far this season move in for Monday and Tuesday. So we're going to feel it over the weekend. It's going to be about 20 degrees cooler over the weekend, but then about 30, 35 degrees cooler next week. So it's definitely going to be a bit of a reality check that yes, we are in to the middle of fall. So in comes the front. That's going to bring in that cooler air. And uh, we saw that storm, that Zeta move through so quickly last night on the jet stream. It just pushed through really quickly. And now behind it, that cooler air is starting to move in our general direction. Still pretty breezy out there. Winds right now at 21 in, Mar in uh, Atlanta, 25 in Marietta, 21 in Canton. And we have a wind advisory in, pl in place, the National Weather Service. Uh, ordering a, a wind advisory, sustained 20 to 25, gust to 35, and the reason why is our trees have been weakened by all the winds we had this morning. The ground is wet, and we could see some more trees toppling tonight, so be very careful when you're around trees or if you're driving, you could end up seeing an obstruction in the, or not seeing an obstruction in the roadway. So be careful out there. We're continuing to see those gusty winds overnight tonight. They'll slowly get a little weaker tomorrow, but they'll still be gusting up to 25 miles per hour, and then we should have wind gusts up around 15 to 18 on our Saturday afternoon. So temperatures right now 59 in Clayton, 59 in Dalton, 52 in Carrollton. It's cooling from west to east. We're still in the low 70s in Athens and Eatonton. And overnight tonight, we're going to get down to around 50 degrees for our overnight low. We should be in the low 60s for a high temperature tomorrow. So I think Friday is going to be a good day to open up the windows. If you don't have power, you're going to be able to get a little refreshment during the day with those temperatures here in the low 60s. So overall, a really nice pattern for this weekend. Cooler, crisper, nice for Halloween, mid 40s to the low 60s on Sunday, upper 40s to the upper 60s. And then Monday, that next blast of cold air comes in. We're going to be down in the 30s Monday and Tuesday morning. We'll probably see our first frost in some neighborhoods, especially to the north. And those daytime temperatures stay cool as well. And we are dry this whole next week. Tomorrow is the final day to request an absentee ballot, but some people who have already requested their absentee ballots still have not received them. One of those people is three time Olympic medalist Alana Myers Taylor. She's training out of state right now and still hasn't received her absentee ballot. She wants to know what her options are to make sure her vote is counted. Well, unfortunately, whether you're in state or out of state, you only have two options to make sure your vote is counted. If you received your absentee ballot, but you're worried about it arriving on time to be counted, you can drop off your vote at a, a box in your county, a secure voting box. But if you still have not received your ballot, your only option is to vote in person and request that your absentee ballot be canceled, either at the, pre the precinct that you go to vote at or by calling your county elections office. Regardless, the Secretary of State's office recommends you contact your county elections office. Another option would be to contact a voter rights advocacy group like Fair Fight Action. They have a hotline with representatives who can help walk you through your issue. That number is on your screen right now. Our 11 Alive Voter Access team is committed to making sure your voice is heard this election season. So if you have a question, something you'd like us to look into, you can send us an email at whereatlspeaks at 11alive.com. You can also text us directly at 404-885-7600. We'll try to help you out in any way we can. We also have our voter access guide. That's 11alive.com slash vote. We're going to take a quick break and be right back. For questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical. A Rhode Island man is winning when it comes to socially distanced candy distribution this Halloween. His handcrafted efforts are sure to make trick or treaters who stop by leave with something sweet. Every year, Reed Paquin says his neighborhood is a popular spot for kids at Halloween, but news of what's expected to be a scaled back celebration got the wheels in his head spinning to do something safe and extra sweet for those trick or treating along Sweetwater Road with hopes for Halloween. He has carefully crafted this candy concoction you see on your screen. This traveling act secures the bag, which then shoots down the string of a bat's mouth. The process can be repeated over and over again. So happy Halloween to the kids that'll get to take part in that. All right, we'll see you on Up Late at 11. More news and weather your way in just a few moments here on the ATL. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station.
today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house clean? 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. Tropical storm Zeta barreled through North Georgia and Metro Atlanta, leaving thousands without power tonight. How crews are working to turn the lights back on in your neighborhood. A small Georgia town with a big Hispanic community. The message a family is sending after 19 members test positive for COVID. And a look at Operation Phoenix, how the FBI is cracking down on crime in Atlanta. Welcome everyone at 10 o'clock. I'm Jeff Hollinger. Three people dead from the storm that raced through our state. Two from Gwinnett County. They were killed when a tree fell on their home. Andy Parati has the tragic story. The fire department did not release the names of those who died, but this is where it happened. This is the home and that is the tree that fell on top of it. In particular, the back side of the tree where the bedroom was, where the couple was sleeping, presumably sleeping in bed, where the tree fell and pinned them, killing them. Now, earlier today, we shot video with our drone showing you a different vantage point of what happened. And what you're looking at is a hardwood tree where the trunk split in half. One half of the trunk fell on the ground, the other on the home, collapsing on the back side of the roof, falling into the couple's bed, killing them. We're told the people who died are young, a man and a woman in their 20s. They were found by the man's brother who stopped by to check on them about noon. After the storm passed, he then called 911. It took crews three to four hours to recover the bodies. Here's the fire department explaining the challenges of getting that done. Well, it's a technical rescue operation. Our technical rescue team is here. They are having to uh, use a large boom from a heavy record to try to stabilize the tree. We don't want the tree to roll or to cause any further collapse or damage. Uh, we're trying to cut away with a saw as we stabilize the tree, trying to release some of the pressure just so we can recover the bodies. More than 400,000 people are without power in Georgia right now, and 1.3 uh, were uh, 1.3 million were without a power at various times. Georgia Power says for many customers, power will probably not be restored until this weekend or later. John Sherrick joins us live. He has the reasoning. Yeah, thousands, Jeff, thousands of power poles snapped in the storms, and they have to be replaced before crews can reconnect the lines. And that could take several days at least. There, you can see that the pole has snapped here. Hundreds of families without power in this southwest Atlanta neighborhood alone. Off Childress Drive near Campbellton Road, falling trees broke the power lines, broke the poles, and K. Joy Peters is worried. Everyone here is blocked in. There is no way out but this road, so we are kind of trapped. With no word from Georgia Power when their street will reopen or when power will come back on. In fact, Georgia Power said that as of late Thursday afternoon, crews had counted thousands of broken poles that need replacing, like these in Buckhead in northwest Atlanta. 4,200 poles in all across North Georgia. The forecast, it will take crews through the weekend at least to replace them all and restore power to those areas. Many residents like Elizabeth Tozer deciding to leave for now. I'm caring for my elderly parents and I'm gonna have to move them for a few days. And while I was talking with Ms. Peters. Oh good, you helped to bring out a truck. A tree removal crew from Georgia Power finally arrived 14 hours after the trees blocked the street. Ms. Peters, I'd like to take credit for this. 
I would like for you to, but that's okay. The street cleared. That's a start, but power will still be out here, probably for several more days. One of the dangers, of course, in trying to clear those trees is that live power lines are often tangled up in the branches. So no one recommends people try to clear those trees by themselves. J J John, you and I have lived here a very long time. I don't remember a storm quite like this one as far as its intensity and how quickly it moved. Not a lot of rain in places, but man, these winds were swirling and cutting and dicing, and they really exacted a lot of damage all through North Georgia. They sure did. You know, you drive through southwest Atlanta, northwest Atlanta, outside the perimeter, entire neighborhoods without power, trees down everywhere. You know, these, the tree canopy is one of Atlanta's trademarks, but at, in, during storms like this, they can become very treacherous. Yeah, absolutely. We had Opal in 95 that, that uh, really caused a lot of damage, but this one, this one looked a lot different, felt different too. Hey, John, thank you. We appreciate the information. Great story. Things ended tragically today in Cherokee County when this large oak fell onto a mobile home. You can barely see the mobile home underneath. A 22-year-old man was killed. Rebecca Lindstrom has the story from Cherokee County. It, this tree kind of tells part of the story. The force wasn't uh, able to rip up the roots, but it was the winds just able to twist and tangle this tree, just rip it apart. It is still being perched up with some other trees that are in the area, keeping it from being yet one more that would fall into the road. Now it was this force that made that large oak tree fall onto that mobile home in Ackworth. 22 year old Franklin White was in his room. Police say when they were able to get into the home, they found him still in his bed. Now he had been renting. He'd only been in the community for about two weeks. So the people in that area were not able to tell us much about him, about his life. But all day, police, fire, tree crews say that they have been bouncing from scene to scene, just trying to undo whatever damage they could. They were falling down on cars, they were falling on, on houses, and they were falling across roadways and power lines. And so it was a, it was a very dangerous situation. We had, I mean, at a given, any given time, I would just estimate, because I don't know a certain number, but I would say we had close to 30 roads closed at one time. It was much the same in Cobb County. If you were trying to get down Sewell Mill Road in East Cobb today, uh, you know it was treacherous. A lot of stop and start and turning around. This tree that you see here still in place. We shot this video at 10 in the morning. The tree still there, but it's now being guarded by police. Cobb County says they received more than 340 calls this morning about downed trees. We know about a dozen of those went into houses. We also saw busted gas lines, power lines, and there are still about 64,000 people in Cobb and Cherokee counties tonight. That's one of the big reasons why Cobb County has canceled school for tomorrow. And we could still see some more trees coming down as we head into the overnight hours because the winds are still pretty gusty. This is when Zeta came through, just came through at a lightning pace, driving about as fast as you would on the interstate. Now it's already exited into the Atlanta and it is in the Atlantic Ocean and it is no more. But it produced some incredible gusts up around 51 miles per hour in Atlanta, 53 in Canton, 51 in Rome. So it was gusty and it gusted for hours. And since then, they've weakened somewhat, but they're still strong enough to bring some weakened trees down. That's why the National Weather Service issued a wind advisory gust still to 35 until 4 in the morning. So be very cautious out there on the roadways. There could be something as you come around a curve. There could be a tree laying there or a limb. So current winds right now, 25 in Atlanta, 21 in Marietta, 20 in uh, LaGrange. So still gusty out there tonight. And as we head into this weekend, it's still going to be breezy at times. And the coolest air of the season is going to be settling in as we head into the next few days, particularly the beginning of next week for Election Day. So coming up, we'll have your Halloween forecast and what you can expect if you still haven't voted what you can expect as far as the weather goes. Samantha, thank you. During a time like this, and we are seeing neighbors helping neighbors, a tree destroyed a disabled veteran's home in Smyrna. And his neighborhood came together to help in his time of need. 11 Alive, she knew her continues our team coverage. An Army veteran here in Smyrna says this is all that's left of his home after this massive tree fell on top of it early Thursday morning. And it's hard to believe that underneath all of this are three cars. He says, all the cars in this driveway 
are destroyed. It was like Dorothy again. I mean, I, I didn't. I thought I was in Kansas. Everything was whirling. Looking at his home Thursday night, Army veteran George Hogue can still remember exactly what the winds Hurricane Zeta brought to Smyrna were like early in the morning. I've never seen it. Been here. 96, never seen winds like that. Hogue says the massive tree, which he estimates is more than 100 feet tall, fell onto his home Thursday around 5 in the morning. He was able to make it out of the house and isn't injured, but that's about all the good news there is. Hogue says now he has no home and no cars. The upstairs attic, it has dropped down into the house, and then the front facade, it's totally open. It's almost like looking at a dollhouse. You can drive. It was a it was a freak show. People would drive by and take photographs. And he's been on his property all day as that happened, getting by on hope and helping hands of his neighbors. I don't want to leave the property. Uh, I'm waiting on. Uh, uh, I, I need direction. Logic is going to go out the window if I do something on my own and it goes against uh, company's policy. So I, I really don't know what to do. Hogue tells me he hasn't heard from his insurance company yet, but in the meantime, he'll hang around his property and wait until he gets further direction. A spike in violent crime in Atlanta linked back to just a few individuals. Why police say the city's a little bit safer tonight. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory. We have some breaking news tonight, football news to pass along. As Clemson quarterback Trevor Lawrence potentially the number one draft pick of 2021 in the NFL and of course from Cartersville has tested positive for the coronavirus. He will have to isolate for 10 days. He will miss the team's next game against Boston College. Clemson coach Dabo Sweeney says that Lawrence is experiencing some mild symptoms and the team without him will be suffering a lot on the football field. We'll see how they fare. They're ranked number one as you know. Ten people arrested in connection with a spike in violent crime in Atlanta. Two more are still wanted. Investigators calling them some of the most dangerous offenders in our city. And with their arrest, crime is dropping. Here's Joe Hankey. Ten defendants in custody, some facing federal charges, other facing state charges in Fulton County. Today, the FBI publicly identified these 10 individuals as being arrested over the past 10 weeks during an ongoing local, state, and federal operation known as Operation Phoenix. Some are charged with assault, others attempted murder, some are charged with drug, firearms, or gang-related crimes. These individuals were repeat violent offenders, that there was some uh, uh, nexus with them and violence. And, and, and they, we deem them to be responsible for some of the most violent crimes in the city of Atlanta. Two suspects still wanted as part of the operation are Jamal Nickel and Demario Leith. During a press conference today, law enforcement officials said around May, crime began to increase in Atlanta as the city began to reopen following COVID-19 closures, and crime also increased around protests and civil unrest. There were aspects of social gatherings and, and ad hoc social gatherings 
that contributed to these er these types of, of crimes. Uh, so it coincided with people gathering up around street racing. Uh, we had uh, a shooting during that time as well. And so that's when we started to see it. Uh, and July was really the, the, the pinnacle. APD Interim Police Chief Rodney Bryant says in July alone there were 24 homicides. As of Wednesday, there have been 117 homicides in the city so far this year, compared to 99 in all of 2019. APD says the men arrested and two still wanted are connected by the crimes committed, with several linked to gangs. And during this afternoon's press conference, law enforcement officials said since arrests began as part of this operation, violent crime in the city of Atlanta has begun to drop off. And they said this is an ongoing operation with more arrests expected. Atlanta police are looking for the suspect in a road rage incident tonight that turned violent. The victim told Caitlin Ross that she had never exchanged a word with the man, but he made his intentions clear. The victim wants to remain anonymous because this guy is still out there on the roads tonight. But she says she had to speak up to warn other drivers. And I saw him fly up behind me. He had to be going 90 plus. Had to be doing the ride my bumper back and forth, you know, the aggressive move. It happened right near the Hartsfield Jackson Airport where 85 and 285 merge. There's a bunch of road work going on that slowed traffic to a crawl. There's a truck in front of me. I have nowhere to go, nowhere. I'm looking at him going, what do you want me to do? She says the driver of this silver Hyundai Accent license plate RVP 2367 pulled into the emergency lane, rolled down his window and threw something metallic at her car. He comes flying up and th starts throwing objects at my car. My windshield's cracked. That's when she got her camera out because she wanted to document the damage. I'm like, great, now I have to get your license plate. So I go to speed back up and that's when he started slowing down and pulled the gun on me. She says she almost couldn't believe her eyes when she saw the gun pointed right at her. She says time slowed down before he sped off. Is this it? Is this how really I'm going to be killed because I couldn't move for this guy? I'm not going to see my family because of a road rage incident. She says she wanted to speak up to warn other drivers about this guy, but also remind every driver on the roads to take it easy. Atlanta, I understand we're under a lot of stress. This, this entire situation has stressed all of us out, but every single car contains a family member to someone and they matter. Stop treating strangers so horribly. She says she saw the driver get off at the MLK drive exit and she kept going. She was understandably shaken up the rest of the day, but she says she wants this guy caught and off the road so he doesn't do it to any other drivers. Well, we are approaching a big weekend. I know we just went through an incredible storm, but I think all of us could use a little bit of R&R uh, &R and just some fun. And hopefully we'll be able to have it on Halloween because the forecast is really perfect. We don't have to worry about rain. It'll be a little chill in the air, but not too cold. Starting out for the trick-or-treaters at 6 p.m., right around 60 degrees by 8 p.m., 55, 10 p.m., 53. So you're not going to be out there sweating in your costume. And we will be dry all weekend long. And on top of it, we're going to have a full moon on Halloween. Perfect. It'll be rising when the first little trick-or-treaters are out there at 7.05. And it'll be nice and cool, right around 61 degrees at moonrise. And this will be the first time in 76 years that every time zone in the U.S. will be able to see the full moon while they're out trick-or-treating at night. So this is going to be a really cool weekend, I do believe. I think we deserve it, too. Hey, nothing was cool about today. It was warm. It was windy. Our temperatures got into the low 80s. That's just crazy for the end of October. It isn't a record, though. 85 is a record for the date, but we got pretty close to it. 82 was our high after a morning low of 70, and we should be around 69 and 50 this time of year. So we were definitely on the warm side. Okay, there goes Zeta. It was moving as fast as you would drive your car on the freeway or almost 55 miles per hour. Uh, now it is already out and it's totally disorganized. There's nothing really left of Zeta. The National Weather Service no longer issuing advisories on Zeta. So boy, it moved through quickly, but it left a big mess with those winds as it moved on through those tropical storm force gusts as it came through Atlanta this morning. And here are the current gusts. It's gusting up to 43 in Atlanta right now, right now, 38 in Marietta, 30 in Canton. So. We could see more trees down tonight easily. Be careful out there on the roadways. If you have some precarious limbs, 
over your house, just you'll stay inside because it is going to be uh, just a little too windy to handle uh, trying to clear anything out of the way right now. It's just too dangerous. So wind advisory in place until four in the morning. So we're going to have to watch for those gusty winds and any debris that could be falling out of the trees. So the next 12 hours, we're going to continue to see those temperatures cool down to 50 degrees. So on our Friday on that scale of one to an 11 with 11 being a perfect day, a nine, a little on the cool side, 50 for a low, 62 for a high. We'll see plenty of afternoon sunshine. And then during the evening, uh, during the afternoon tomorrow, getting up into the low 60s. And then during the evening for Friday night football, check that out. It's going to be cool. It's going to be a cocoa day or cocoa evening out there on the bleachers. And you can take your stadium blanket and wear your jackets. It's going to be a little chilly out there. So it's going to feel like good football weather. A cool, crisp weekend for Halloween. Very nice for trick or treating. Fall back. On your Saturday night, get an extra hour of sleep on Sunday, and then we are cool and dry next week. Look how chilly it is on Election Day. Mid-30s to the low 60s. Burr, so bundle up if you haven't voted yet. Take a look at this video. This came to us from Gulfport, Mississippi, where the boats are now sitting in parking lots. Isn't this just so sad to see? What a powerful storm, almost a Cat 3 major hurricane. This McDonald's sign just shreds. It is a mess out there and a lot of cleanup to be done. You know, if you'd like to be an alumni live storm tracker, they helped us so much tracking Zeta last night with information and photos and video. Thank you so much, storm trackers. If you'd like to be one, go to our Eleven Alive Storm Tracker Facebook page, sign up, and hopefully we'll see your work right here. Samantha, thank you. A popular restaurant accused of racial discrimination when it goes to its dress code. An interesting story from both sides coming up next. Cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On dispute between an Atlanta couple and a very popular restaurant has gone viral. The customers posted about it on Instagram, accusing Umi of racial discrimination over a dress code. It is an interesting story with video that will give you pause for thought. Here's Latasha Givens. 
She has all our videos. The cell phone video posted on Instagram and shared thousands of times shows part of a heated exchange between a customer and an employee at Umi Restaurant in Buckhead. How crazy is that? She has all the Adidas sneakers. You can hear the two arguing, the man saying he was asked to leave because he was wearing athletic shoes. He accuses the restaurant of racial discrimination, pointing to a white woman in the restaurant who was also wearing sneakers. Tensions rise and police show up moments later. Jordan, you gonna oh, I wear black people clothes, so I'm straight. Shut the no Oh, the people online wanted to know more about what happened, so we reached out to the couple and the owner. We spoke with the owner, Farshid Arshid, by phone. 1,000% it was a mistake. Arshid says the dress code for the restaurant is posted out front and has been there for several years, but he admits they have not been perfect with enforcing it. Social media responding to the viral Instagram post with pictures of other people with athletic shoes dining at the restaurant. Arshid says he considers it an operational issue, not a racial one, touting the restaurant's diverse clientele, but he says he takes full responsibility. It was an absolute shortcoming from us. That, okay. That's what I like everybody to know, and I like everybody to know that that we are very sorry about how we handled it. The dispute caused such an uproar, Yelp had to temporarily limit comments until they could get more information. Arshid says his apology is not just to the couple, but also to the community. It's our establishment. We should have done better. We're beyond sorry and apologetic to the community. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. 
on 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched. A rare weather event leaves its mark on Metro Atlanta. Communities recovering tonight after Tropical Storm Zeta swept through North Georgia with driving rain and fierce winds. The force of those winds causing widespread, even deadly damage, bringing down large trees in the early morning hours, crashing onto homes occupied by sleeping couples, trapping people inside their neighborhoods. The chaos cutting power for thousands in North Georgia. More than 400,000 now still, still are without power tonight. Hundreds of crews working to clear tangled and tattered power lines in order to restore electricity. It has been a mess. Say to move fast and things calming down near us. Meteorologist Samantha Moore joins us now. And, and what can we expect tonight and tomorrow and above and beyond that? Well, we still have some gusty winds we're going to have to deal with, Jeff. Even though it is calmer than it was this morning, that's for sure. It's still pretty windy out there. And the trees are in such a state after the storm just moved through so quickly that a lot of them have weakened. So we're going to have to watch that carefully. It is pushing out to sea. It is no more. And it's just hard to believe that less than 24 hours ago we were dealing with a tropical storm. And now it's already out to sea. And look what's happening here in the Caribbean. The Lesser Antilles, we're seeing a disturbance start to strengthen here. And it's headed for the Caribbean kind of similarly to what Zeta did. 70% chance of development the next five days. Tropical season is alive and well, and hurricane season doesn't end to the end of November. So we, I'm afraid we still may have some rough days ahead to weather. Hopefully not moving in like Zeta did, hopefully. Look at these wind gusts, 43 miles per hour right now in Atlanta, 38 miles per hour in Marietta. These aren't the peak gusts. This is this hour. We're seeing winds still gusting up to 43 miles per hour. Wind advisory in place to the early morning hours. We could see more trees coming down. Be very careful if there's anything in your yard that could come down or there's anything on the roadways. You want to drive carefully out there tonight as we're going to end up seeing more trees probably coming down tonight given their state. So overnight we'll see those temperatures starting to cool and then a big cool down for the weekend. We'll have all those details coming up in just a few minutes. Alrighty, thank you. Mm -hmm. Today was the second to last day of early voting, but the Secretary of State says a foul weather caused issues for 15 counties in all. Cobb County had to shut down four of its 11 polling locations, while Fulton County placed mobile voting units at two of the seven sites that lost power. And as 11 Alive's Doug Richards shows us, none of Douglas County's five early voting sites opened on time. The Douglas County Courthouse is this county's busiest early voting site which was evident today, even though the site was closed because of a power outage. We saw voters continually showing up to try to get into the locked building, turned away by power outages that compelled the county to initially shut down all five of its early voting sites. Douglas County experienced widespread power outages through much of the day. Another early voting site at Deer Lick Park was likewise shut tight as would-be voters drove up only to find the gates locked. The polls close for early voting tomorrow, so uh, hopefully the courthouse will be open tomorrow, or I have to find out if there's another place in Douglas County to go vote for. Will this deter you from voting? No, no, I'll try to find a way again. I guess I'll just wait for election day, but no matter what, I'm still voting. By early afternoon, Douglas County had opened two of its five early voting precincts. This was Dog River Park Library, where a line had formed when we visited mid-afternoon. Douglas County hopes to have all of its sites back open by Friday, and the county announced it has added two sites to Friday's roster in order to help compensate for the lost time today. You can find those sites on 11alive.com. An inmate's family says the Cobb County Detention Center did not do enough to keep the brother safe while he suffered from mental illness. Jail records were released after a judge ordered the sheriff to produce them for us. It followed a lawsuit by 11 Alive. Reveal investigator Andy Parati has the story the sheriff tried to stop. 
Kelly. This is Cobb County Sheriff Burke. It is. A concerned father calls the Cobb County Jail in 2019, warning staff his son, Bradley Emery, could potentially hurt himself. I've got a young a son out there, and since he's been in there, I've had to call out there several times and have him on suicide watch because he's threatening to hurt himself. From the day he arrived at the detention center, staff knew Emory had attempted suicide in the past. One of them noting in a report, Emory advised that he cut his wrist a couple of months ago when his wife threatened to leave. The 33-year-old suffered from mental illness related to a traumatic brain injury. His family says the jail knew that. At the time, Emory was in custody for drug possession. He was a troubling inmate. He, he had issues, family issues. On Valentine's Day, jail staff found a rope made out of a torn mattress cover inside Emory's cell. His father, Don, growing more concerned for his son's mental health. Yes, he's been in terrible shape since he's been in there. I worry about him. He's my youngest. According to jail records, staff placed Emery under close observation at least two different times for threatening to hurt himself. Each time he was allowed to return to the general population after signing a contract promising not to kill himself. During that time, Emery sent this letter to his family writing, suicide is the only solution to my misery. Four days later, a fellow inmate found Emery in the shower with the bed sheet tied around his neck. 278 and it started a single floor. There's no pulse. Emery died three days later. While sheriff investigators found its staff did nothing wrong, Emery's family says the detention center did not do enough to keep him safe. I loved him to death. James is Emery's brother. So, you know, they put him on site watch and within hours they let him back out. Emory joins a list of hundreds of inmates who have died inside Georgia's four largest county jails. 217 deaths since 2004. Only one of them investigated by an outside agency. The rest, sheriff staff cleared themselves of any wrongdoing. State Representative David Wilkerson wants to change that. It should be investigated by the separate parties. Held by our investigations in the Cobb County's detention center, Wilkerson plans to introduce legislation that would require an outside independent investigation into all jail fatalities. So if this is really about making sure the jails run safe and making sure that uh, people have a chance to have their day in court, then you'd want that independent investigation. Days after his son's death, Emory's father called the jail begging for answers. Can I get someone to, you know, someone that's got some answers? He died waiting from a heart attack. After, after I put him on suicide watch, and y'all guarantee me you were gonna watch him every 15 minutes. My son's dead. The sheriff did not want to be interviewed, but he did say over the phone that each time a family member called, concerned for Emory's well-being, they had staff check on him. They say they simply cannot monitor inmates every second of the day. They also say they hope to get funding to install a security camera in the pod where Emory was detained. Andy has been investigating conditions inside the Cobb County Detention Center for more than a year following the death of Kevil Wingo. He died alone in a padded cell despite begging for medical help for hours. You can watch Andy's previous stories on our 11 Alive YouTube page. All this week we've been focusing on the lesser shown impacts of COVID on some of Georgia's overlooked rural communities, people of color, and uh, they are particularly vulnerable. A recent survey found nearly half of Hispanic and Latino renters fear, fear that they cannot pay the rent on time. Here's Matt Pearl. You come into Dalton and you really don't see anything more than any other suburban town. But then you go to the, across the railroad tracks, and you start seeing a lot of the taquerias, handwritten signs, colored signs. I'm in the heart of the, the Hispanic community. I would think that that's everybody's dream, to belong to a community that you care about and a family that you love. My name is Dora Prime. Here is a good picture, too. My family and I moved to Dalton in May of 1979. My mother was diagnosed with congestive heart failure. 
the end of June, she just started getting worse and worse and worse. Family, friends were there to say their farewells, eating together around the table, um, talking, and doing what we weren't supposed to do. You know, we, 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 we defied the, the recommendations of COVID protection. 19 of us ended up getting infected. My little brother, Julio, she's gone and, and he's there to you. Most of our families are considered essential workers. They lost jobs in hotels, in cleaning, um, maybe in agriculture. This is the carpet capital of the world. Sometimes they are working seven days a week nonstop. Eight, 10, 12 hour shifts. And if the demand for the product is there, they have to do that. There is a disconnect and a distrust with our uh, healthcare system here. When you go to the health department and they have to pass the jail, our community has been attacked uh, in a very negative way. They are the um, workforce of this community. And uh, in spite of all of that, never been recognized for their contributions. The schools are open now. Many things they are trying to go back to normal, but uh, we are trying to reinforce and remember that the virus is not going to go away. We need to take care of each other in order to go through this uh, pandemic. This is from my visit on Monday. I prayed before I went in and I said, Lord, help me bring healing and a little bit of joy to my brother. Just help me, use me. It is not easy. I wouldn't desire this on anybody. And I pray for all the COVID victims because there are many. A little more than two weeks after I interviewed Dora Price, in fact, just this past Friday, she sent me a text message to tell me her little brother had passed away. Julio Salazar was 55 years old, one of now nearly 8,000 Georgians who have lost their lives to COVID-19. Pulling back the veil on health care costs, the Trump administration's latest move to help consumers. With the NBA draft right around the corner, top prospects all over the country are getting ready. We'll check out the Ant-Man, Anthony Edwards, his pro day coming up next. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks.
Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take Early voting numbers remain strong in Georgia despite this morning's tropical storm. Today alone, nearly 150,000 people cast ballots. Since early voting began, more than 3.6 million people have voted. Tomorrow is the last day for early voting in person. An absentee ballot must be received by 7 p.m. on Tuesday. Tomorrow, the final day to request an absentee ballot, but some people who have already requested their absentee ballots have not received them as of yet. One of those is three-time Olympic medalist Elena Myers-Taylor. She is training out of state right now, hasn't received her absentee ballot. She wants to know what her options are to make sure her vote is counted. Unfortunately, whether you're in state or out, you only have two options to make sure your vote is counted. If you have received your ballot, but you're worried about it arriving in time to be counted, you can go drop off your absentee ballot in one of the drop boxes in your county. But if you still haven't received your ballot, your only option is to go vote in person and request your absentee ballot be canceled either at the precinct or by calling your county elections office. Regardless, the Secretary of State's office recommends you contact your county elections office. Another option would be to contact a voter rights advocacy group. They have a hotline with representatives who can help walk you through that issue. The number is on your screen. It's Fair Fight Action Hotline. That is Stacey Abrams' group. The Trump administration is pushing a new policy that would require insurers to disclose pricing for common tests and procedures up front. The pitch comes days ahead of the election as President Trump has been hammered by Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden over his response Here, to the pandemic. I if approved, the requirements would take effect car, gradually over a four-year period. The Trump administration has already tried to require hospitals to disclose prices, but the measure is facing a federal lawsuit from the industry alleging coercion and interference with business practices. Well, it is that time of year we expect to have fall-like conditions, and it looks like they'll be returning in a pretty big way over the weekend, and then even more so next week. So two kind of blasts of cooler air slated to move in the next few days. And, you know, it is that time of year as well that we fall back. So uh, you may want to check your smoke detectors. Firefighters always advise that when we fall back and spring forward, we change the batteries in our smoke detectors. So basically, it's going to be the sun's going to be setting a lot earlier next week at like 5:45. The sun's going to be going down after we fall back on Sunday. The one bonus we get an hour of sleep on Sunday morning, and it's going to feel pretty chilly too. So it might be kind of nice to get a little extra snooze time on Sunday. So let's take a look at the weather pattern that we're expecting to see as we head in through this weekend. Cooler air moving in, coming in out of Canada, across the Great Lakes, and then settling in across the eastern third of the nation. That'll usher in the coolest temperatures we have had at the beginning of next week. The coolest we've had so far this fall, getting down in the 30s, likely start seeing our first frost. Yes, uh, at least across parts of northeast Georgia. No frost advisory yet. We'll let you know if they issue one as we get a little closer, though. So that frontal system's moving in. It's going to push all this humid air out of the way that we experienced this week with uh, Tropical Storm Zeta. It was really oppressive 
today. Despite the wind, it was hot and it was humid and, and windy. But uh, those temperatures today making it all the way up to 84 in Athens and Eatonton, 82 in Atlanta and Marietta and Peachtree City, unseasonably warm, just three degrees shy of our record. Now we're in the 50s and those temperatures are going to continue to cool. Interesting though, notice it's 70 in Athens and it's 48 in Carrollton. So that cooler air has not reached the eastern third of our state yet, but it will overnight. And it's going to come in on a brisk wind too. Look at these wind gusts. This is at this hour still seeing 43 mile per hour gusts in Atlanta, 38 mile per hour gusts in Marietta. So that's when the National Weather Service issued a wind advisory, just concerned that the trees are so weakened from being blown around so abruptly last night, so rigorously, and the ground is saturated. We could see more trees going down tonight with gusts up to 35 miles per hour, and, and the gusts are even stronger than that right now in Atlanta. So be careful out on the roadways. There could be some debris that you come around the corner. You're not expecting to see a limb or a tree in the middle of the road. So the next 12 hours, temperatures get down around 50 degrees. We'll see a few clouds out there tonight and into the morning hours, but they should clear during the afternoon. A 9 on your ozometer on that scale of 1 to 11, 11 being a perfect day, a 9, 50 to 62. And then as we head in through the day tomorrow, getting up into the low 60s, look at that sunshine. It's going to be a beautiful day and a nice night for football, too, with temperatures cooling down to around 50 degrees, maybe even getting up around 49 degrees at 11 o'clock. Yes, it is indeed going to be a, kind of a cool evening for football. And those temperatures are just going to continue to cool down even more as we head in through this weekend. 45 for a low temperature on Saturday morning. So you know it's going to be nice for those trick-or-treaters. And after these sh few showers in North Georgia work their way out, we're going to be nice and dry for the next seven days and cool as well. Halloween looks great. Mid-40s to the low 60s. Perfect trick-or-treating weather. Fall back on Sunday morning, early in the morning. And then we'll see that cool air moving in for Election Day. We're talking mid-30s for a low to the low 60s. So bundle up if you still haven't had the opportunity to vote. New tonight, Clemson head coach Davos Swinney announcing that Cartersville grad Trevor Lawrence has tested positive for COVID. Sweeney said that Lawrence has mild symptoms. He is in isolation for at least 10 days. That's according to ACC rules. Trevor will miss Saturday's game against Boston College. It's not clear yet if he will be available when they take on uh, Notre Dame, but I'm reading a lot on Twitter tonight from a lot of very good reporters that indicate that he will be ready for that Notre Dame game. Falcons in action right now on the road in Charlotte, and they lead 19-17 in the fourth quarter. Falcons with the lead in the fourth quarter. Get your kids away from the TV set. <laughs> you know what that means. The offense has had a lot of success tonight, just struggling to get into the end zone. Julio Jones has over 100 yards receiving for the third time this season. But the big news out of the game so far, Falcons receiver Calvin Ridley leaving with an ankle injury in the opening half, and it has been that kind of season, has it? Not 1917 in the fourth quarter right now. Falcons have a lead on the Panthers. All right. Former Georgia guard Anthony Edwards, the Ant-Man, had a pro day put on by his agency in California today. He is the assumed number one overall pick in this year's NBA draft, and the stars came out to see him. LeBron James, Anthony Davis, Quavo, and Hawks guard Trey Young were all in attendance. He participated in on-court drills and interviews, getting ready for the draft on November 18th. Now, even though Anthony Edwards was one and done at UGA, he learned a lot from being an athlete. Maria Martin caught up with the highest ranked recruit to ever play for the dogs. It was a short stay, a brief time. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Anyway, here's Maria's story. At the University of Georgia. That moment sparked something the University of Georgia could marvel at for a long time. The top recruit in the country in 2019 picking the dogs. I feel like college was a great experience for me because when I had bad games, people would talk about me. I had good games, people would talk about me. Talk good, talk bad. So, like, I feel like I needed that. And it's a good thing he's used to the chirping because now he's potentially going to go number one overall in the NBA draft. Why do you feel like you're the most NBA ready? I feel like because of the uh, physical gifts uh, that God gave me. I mean, my body, my, my size, it's not too many 6'5 guards, it's like 225 that can move like me. I think he's got an incredible future. I think he's going to get nothing but better. Edwards is ready for the NBA. His only hope, though, is to continue wearing the only number he's ever worn, number five. My birthday's on the 5th. 
My sister's birthday is on the fifth, and my mom and grandma passed on the fifth. So I just I love number five. To the basket. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Prime Time, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here. All right, that's it for us tonight. 11 Alive's Up Late is momentarily away, and we hope you have a good evening. Hope you get your power back on if you're watching us on Battery. cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage.